Hi, I'm John Rossman, author of The Amazon Way. Everybody wants to be a great leader, to become a better leader. Everybody wants innovation. Everybody wants growth. Everybody believes in customer centricity. But do we really know how does leadership need to evolve in order to achieve those things? My goal is to give you a set of tools, principles, and approaches, oftentimes from Amazon, to help you become a better leader to compete and win in the digital era. Let's get started. First, let's break open that word leadership. Big word. Everybody thinks that they're a good leader, but do we really pay attention to what does it mean? How do I act? How do I evolve in today's economy? So there's a great definition for leadership. Leadership is a practical skill encompassing the ability of an individual group or organization to lead, which means to influence or guide other individuals or organizations. Scholars define leadership as a process in which a person enlists the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task or mission. So leadership is actually a process. There's a set of tools. There's collaboration that needs to happen. Let's break open the Amazon playbook to help define what leadership is and give you a set of tools in order to evolve your leadership for innovation. There's 14 leadership principles at Amazon. The first is probably the most famous and the most important, and it reads this. Leaders start with the customer and work backwards. They work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. And while they pay attention to competitors, they obsess about customers. The first of the leadership principles at Amazon, the most interesting word in that leadership principle is the word obsession. We could have used an easier word, a more comfortable word, like focused on our customer or in tune with our customers. But instead we chose a very pungent word, a word that you know when you're around somebody who's obsessed with something. How does somebody feel or how do you react to somebody who's obsessed with something, maybe a football team? Well, they seem weird, they seem disoriented. They spend time and attention on things that maybe seem irresponsible to us. That's exactly how Amazon intends their principled approach on customer centricity to a feel, that they are being irresponsible in order to grow and pay attention to their customers. It's important to have mechanisms on these principles. So one important mechanism is called the voice of the customer. A voice of a customer is a program that helps bring issues, challenges, frustrations that a customer might be uh, facing in your business, bring it to a point where we can discuss it and actually bring resolution to it. So many of us want to become more customer centric, but we actually don't spend much time actually understanding or defining what does it mean to be customer centric? When aren't we customer centric? What's the current state versus the future state? How would we act differently if we were more customer centric? So the point of all of this is this lesson, which is think about how you think about customer centricity, putting the customer at the center of everything that you do will help you better understand the customer, have better empathy, think about broader ways to serve that customer and drive as the fulcrum, as the lever to help us improve going forward so that we are actually innovating on behalf of the customer. Let's talk about friction and the important role it plays in innovating. What is friction? Friction is all the little things that we ask our customers to do because we haven't quite completed or perfected our processes, our systems, our products, our interfaces with our customers, right? It's all those little things that they still have to do in order to get the outcome that they want. How does friction manifest itself? Friction manifests itself as customer questions, customer complaints, long repeated conversations, the way our competition talks about us. 
One of the early insights Amazon came to was that really the best service is no service, that customers don't truly want to have to ask questions, have comments, have discussions about products and services. They really want to understand and to accomplish their outcome. Amazon's 27 year history could be argued as a journey of just reducing customer friction all the way through the customer experience. So the lesson is this, the best service is no service. Pay attention to all the little things that customers say, the questions, the complaints, the comments, and work to resolve those. But the question is, how do you spot those? How do you actually identify where the friction is? You do that through your metrics, right? Metrics are the critical insight, the data that provides you where is the customer experience? Where is the friction? Where am I being inefficient? I oftentimes get asked, what was my time like at Amazon? Like, what was, what's the most consistent memory you have? The weekly rhythm at Amazon was all about metrics, defining metrics, reviewing metrics as a team, trying to get to the root cause and the action behind them. Do you know what website you go to if you go to relentless.com? You actually go to Amazon. It was an early name that Bezos considered for Amazon. And while that obviously isn't the name that was chosen, they keep that domain alive as a message to all of its employees that they are going to be relentless about using data to reduce customer friction. So the lesson is this, make metrics a verb. Always be acting to define more metrics so that you truly understand what the customer experience is and where the friction is and be working to take action on it. How do you actually improve it? Make metrics a verb. So this is a picture of a beta partnership that was in Germany several years ago. And it was a partnership between Amazon DHL and Audi. And what this partnership allowed a customer to do was to order an item and have it delivered to the trunk of their car without specifying where their car was, right? The DHL delivery, the customer would order, DHL delivery person would get the location of the, the car, one-time electronic fob, open up the trunk, put the package in, close the trunk, fob's disabled. What a great customer experience. Every time I think about this, I go, it's just a use case that's right in front of us, but for some reason, we don't recognize it. The future of great customer experiences is going to be integrated between multiple products, which means it's going to be integrated between multiple companies. And so all of us have to get good at the things that help integrate user experiences, technical capabilities like APIs, business capabilities, legal capabilities. But remember this. The future of great customer experiences are across multiple products, multiple enterprise. We need to explore and integrate across the entire customer experience to truly create a culture of innovation. That's where the opportunity is. If you look at where so many upstarts and startups are having success, it's in integrating across what has traditionally been multiple products and multiple companies. Leadership number three at Amazon is about invention and simplification. Most companies don't have a game or a value in actually creating patents. At Amazon, they do. It's a big cultural uh, statement and norm to create patents at Amazon. Guess what the entire reward is for being a patent holder, for winning a patent at Amazon? Like what's the prize that you get? Well, you get a couple of things. First is you get a piece of acrylic plastic, this piece of acrylic plastic that isn't even really signed by Bezos. So maybe that costs $5. And on the internal phone tool at Amazon, this, the site that you go to in order to find other people at Amazon, next to your name and your picture, you get a little icon uh, of this puzzle piece. 
that is the entire reward system. And people fight over this because it's, it's a type of social currency and social status within Amazon. If you want to change behavior, find ways of recognizing the behavior you want. So the lesson is, Find a simple way to recognize invention and customer centricity. Find authentic, true mechanisms that help recognize when somebody is really doing the right thing, they're solving a problem, they're using data, they're reducing friction, they're building customer centricity. Find a simple way to recognize them. What are Amazon's most important innovations? I think a lot of us might think of some current things like the Amazon Echo and Alexa. AWS is an entire business of innovations. That's Amazon's cloud business. I think Amazon's most important innovations are some of the things that we did very early on. Things like free everyday shipping, selling used items and new items on the exact same detail page, having third-party sellers sell products to our customers. Those were the real innovations at Amazon. And they were real innovations because they changed traditions. And one thing that was in common on all of those innovations is that we were ridiculed. Amazon doesn't understand the business. It's unsustainable. It's not affordable. Can you imagine a world today without free everyday shipping? I don't think most of us can. So the lesson from this is that if you're truly gonna innovate, if you're truly gonna change traditions, if you're truly gonna obsess for your customers, you have to be willing to mis be misunderstood. Oftentimes for a long period of times, your critics, your competitors, people won't understand the intuition that goes on behind true innovations, which is about changing industry traditions. I was at Amazon from early 2002 through late 2005. I got to launch and scale the marketplace business, which is third party selling at amazon.com. Today, that's over 50% of all units shipped and sold. In 2002, that was the third attempt at a third party selling business at Amazon. As early as that, that was already the third attempt at that. There had been auctions, there had been Z shops. And as Bezos said, unfortunately, nobody showed up. It would have been extremely easy for Bezos to give up the, the strategy and the vision of having third parties selling at amazon.com. I know that much, many of the board, the press, investors were encouraging him to just stay focused on being a first party retailer in the books and music business. But he knew it was essential for Amazon to grow beyond those categories and that in order to do that, he needed to have third party selling. And so the lesson is this, you need to be, you need to be committed to your vision, but flexible on the details. Too often when we're trying something new, we give up too easily. We confuse strategy with execution and that maybe our execution or the approach that we're taking isn't the right approach, but that the strategy is still the right strategy. So be thoughtful about the difference between strategy and the outcome that you want to accomplish versus the tactics that you're using to get there. Be willing to iterate on the tactics be slow to iterate on the vision and on the strategy. Leadership principle number four is called leaders are right a lot. And it reads this, leaders are right a lot. They have strong judgment and good instincts. They seek diverse perspectives and work to disconfirm their beliefs. I think the most interesting insight in that leadership principle is the recommendation to seek diverse perspectives and work to disconfirm your beliefs. But what do most of us do? What are, how are most companies set up? Like-minded individuals, we're motivated to get along. There's group think that is going on. You have to be very thoughtful and very 
uh, directed in how do you actually get opposing opinions, new ideas into your organization. Going to conferences, hearing people talk is one way of doing that. Investing time in understanding not just your competitors, but new startups, new alternatives that maybe today sound silly, impossible, infeasible. But if you squint just enough, maybe you can see what the potential is for a certain capability. So the recommendation is this, put mechanisms or techniques in place to disconfirm your beliefs. Be a student of new capabilities and people who believe things differently. Most of the time, you'll confirm what you already believe in. There's value in that. But once in a while, you may learn something new, be willing to adjust your position, and that can be the basis for expanding and for innovating. So this quote, I believe we are the best place in the world to fail, comes from one of Amazon's shareholder letters. I believe it's the 2015 shareholder letter. If you don't read Amazon's shareholder letters, I would encourage that you do. It would be a great way to help you disconfirm your beliefs. But in this, Jeff starts off, I believe we are the best place in the world to fail. Not too many CEOs would start off a shareholder letter with a statement like that. He quickly follows up with, though, that the, the quote that most companies embrace the idea of invention and innovation, but are unwilling to suffer the string of failed experiments in order to get there. The most important word in that statement is the word failure. When Jeff's talking about failure, he's talking about experimentation, we test something, we, we learn something, it works or it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, that's failure. But what happens in most organizations who are trying to innovate and test something out is that they, that word failure is overloaded. It can mean both experimentation as well as poor execution, poor approaches in doing something. We want experimentation. We will never accept poor execution. One of the recommendations I work with my clients on is that, is that we don't use the word failure because it's confusing. We use the word experimentation or innovation or hypotheses when we are talking about innovating. So the recommendation is this, understand the difference between experimentation and poor execution. We want experimentation. We need to be very specific about when we are innovating, when we are trying something new, and we will never accept poor execution. We always need to be thoughtful and execute appropriately. So just avoid that word failure when we are talking about innovation, but we do want to become a great place for experimentation. So the question is, what, how does Amazon go about experimenting? What is Amazon's system for innovation? I oftentimes ask audiences, who here believes that innovation is critical for their organization's success over the next five to 10 years? Typically, everybody in the audience will raise the hand. And then I'll ask, who here has an actual process for how they review ideas, invest in ideas, quickly experiment, decide to go forward or don't go forward. They have specific approaches and gates and accountabilities and budgets for doing that. Typically, nobody raises their hand. And it's that, it's that disconnect between the fact that we know that innovation is critical, but we actually don't have a process. So Amazon's process for innovation is called working backwards. And the whole approach is about seeking clarity of a concept of an idea before we proceed on it. They have several techniques of writing these out. They, they talk about narratives, they do, they do future press releases, they do FAQs or frequently asked questions, all before they decide to do something. And so they're essentially experimenting and clarifying what that idea is. This quote here, we don't do PowerPoint presentations at Amazon because it doesn't capture the details of the essence or of the conversations. Instead, we write narratively structured six page memos. We silently read one at the beginning of each meeting in a kind of study hall. That's from an Amazon shareholder letter. 
I wrote the future press release for the marketplace business in 2002. It had one simple sentence that made all the difference. A third party seller in the middle of the night will be able to register, list an item, fulfill an order and delight a customer as though Amazon the retailer had done it. Pretty simple sentence imposed a tremendous amount of complexity and obligation on both Amazon as well as our third party sellers, very different than the mindset of eBay, which was the largest marketplace at, at that point. Just to do self-service registration, there was over 20 teams that needed to integrate their capabilities together into a registration pipeline. Nobody reported to me, none of these people reported to me. Every week I would go in and ask, how's your work going on self-service registration? John, I'm sorry, other priorities have come up. You've been triaged. And, and I would say, hey, no problem. Why don't you come up to the ST meeting with me this week in order to explain why we won't be able to register in the middle of the night with, with nobody paying attention? Guess what would happen? People would reverse course, somehow figure out how to get the work done. The lesson is this. Writing is a superpower. Even if you do it just for yourself, your new ideas, your new concepts, your problems, your insights about friction, write those out. Because if you can write them out into full paragraphs, who's the customer? What's the situation? What do you propose to do about it? You will clarify and, and do a better job at both understanding the situation and communicating it to others. Let's talk about guided wandering. Oftentimes in life, we know, or in business, we know what we want to accomplish, so we put a plan in place and we execute. It, it's a straightforward progression that we should have. Innovating, inventing, improving is oftentimes different than that. It's more like wandering. We, we know approximately what we want to accomplish, but we don't know exactly how to proceed on it. But it's not random either. It needs to be guided by intuition, by insights, by a set of perspectives on, on what we think the customer wants, what the future is. I got to travel a few times with Bezos. At one of the meetings, he was asked, how does Amazon decide what to innovate on, what to try? And he goes, I believe in thinking about durable customer needs, needs that you can't imagine changing over time. Because if you understand those durable customer needs, then even if your attempt, your experiment fails, you're still learning from it and you're still saying within the same swim lane. And he said for Amazon at that point, so this is obviously 20 years ago, but at Amazon at that point, the durable customer needs that he believed in were these, that he can't imagine a world where a customer wants less selection. He can't imagine a world where a customer wants a higher price. And he couldn't imagine a world where a customer wants slower delivery or less convenience. And so those were the three swim lanes in which Amazon was going to continue to reduce friction and, and innovate in. And so what we need to have is this perspective of understanding when should I be proceeding with a specific plan versus when am I more into guided wandering? So the lesson is this, that the big concepts, the big ideas, the real big changes and inventions typically come from, from wandering, from inventing, from doing something new, which is not a straightforward process. And you need to really understand that process of wandering. How do you actually wander? Like, how do you actually set up experiments? So there's lots of great methodologies, lots of great tools in order to do this, but at its core, innovating on a systematic basis takes these three things. First is we have to create a set of hypotheses. Think of these as bets. I believe something to be true about the future, about my customer, about some unmet need. But you have to state it so that you recognize that you actually don't understand what it is. It's a bet. The second thing you need to do is you need to have uh, an approach to um, testing these, right? So there's the agile method, methodology, minimally viable products. What all of those are trying to do is to create as lightweight 
and fast and cheap as approach as possible of testing just that concept, just that idea. And the third part is you need to understand your portfolio, right? So this is a simple portfolio, simply measures potential benefit versus risk. What most organizations, what most operators are good at is that lower left-hand quadrant, which is well understood projects, proposals, investments that you can make. If I execute well, I know what I'm going to get back. But what most of us aren't don't understand well is that upper right-hand quadrant. Those, those are the bets. Those are the little things that we need to try, that we need to experiment, that we need to wander in and understand that they not, might not succeed exactly as we understand them, but then we're going to proceed to the next step within that hypothesis. So in order to innovate, you actually need to have a process for that innovation. And that's a very distinct and different process than scaling and operating. One of Bezos' longtime discussions is about uh, being a day one organization. And, and to him and to Amazon, what a day one organization is one that's always looking to invent is looking forward to the future and is going to invest in the future versus resisting it. And so in one of the shareholder letters, the 2016 shareholder letter, Jeff breaks out, well, what, what does it mean to be a day one versus day two company? And what are some of the things that you can do if you're a day two company? And a day two company is essentially a company that's trying to optimize just for today and isn't investing or optimistic or trying to create what the future is. One of the things he recommended was to embrace external trends. External trends are the concepts, the things that others are doing, maybe the new and disruptive technologies that sound perhaps infeasible, sound like they don't pertain to your business, but actually, if you can imagine the future, you go, oh, that might actually dramatically change or integrate for the customer experience. So the lesson is this, it's far easier and cheaper to fail at being early than to fail by being late. And the way that you fail early is by spending time studying and experimenting early, paying attention early to external trends, and then picking the point at which you might want to do one of those bets to have one of those small little pieces of your portfolio to perform an experiment on. It's far cheaper, far, far more proactive in order to experiment early than to pay the downsides of waiting until it's too late. Leadership principle number nine at Amazon is about having a bias for action. And uh, speed in, mat in business matters, it matters a lot. In big companies especially, where speed slows down is in making decisions. Do we do something? Do we not do something? Do we make a change? Do we not make a change? So understanding how you make decisions is really important and, and understanding different types of decisions. Amazon has a simple framework for this. It's called one-way doors versus two-way doors. A one-way door decision is the type of decision that once you make it, it's impossible to come back. So an acquisition might be an example of a one-way door decision. One-way door decisions, we need to slow down, we need to bring them to the center, we need to spend time, go through it multiple times. A two-way door decision is actually a decision that if we, we can make it, we can test it, and if it's not the right decision, we can reverse it. The natural tendency is to make most two-way door decisions into one-way door decisions, right? You group a bunch of decisions together and then all of a sudden it's a one-way door decision. So we need to think about how we break what seems like a big decision down into smaller components. And then how do we proceed? How do we test those and be faster about be making our decisions and decentralize those decisions, push them out closer to the field, closer to the customer? So the lesson is this, speed in business matters. We need to be fast about making the right types of decisions. So think about how do you make decisions? What's your decision-making framework? 
understand the difference between the one-way door decisions versus the two-way door decisions and try to have a different set of speed relative to that. Because when you're in that systematic innovation cycle of setting bets, agile process, having your portfolio, you need to make those decisions as fast as possible. The 14th leadership principle at Amazon is about delivering results. And leaders at Amazon are expected to deliver hard results despite setbacks and despite dependencies. So we spend a lot of time at Amazon defining what are all of the goals that we might have and what are the things that we could do in order to accomplish those things, right? Those are the inputs, focusing on the inputs in order to get to something versus just what the output is. We use the narratives, we would write these things out, we would debate them, but most of all, we would focus so much more on the controllable inputs of what we can do versus the outputs that we were trying to attain. And so that would always help us be better planners and better thoughtful execution and, and deliberation of understanding how are you going to actually accomplish something. There's some really good frameworks out there in order to do this. OKRs, which stands for Objectives and Key Results, is a, is a popular one that helps you really understand how do I set a big goal, but then actually define the key results that are going to help get me there. So the lesson is this, spend more time defining what your controllable inputs, the things that I can do, that I can take control of in order to achieve a goal versus just defining the goal and then losing track of how are we going to actually accomplish that? Because at that point, hope is really your plan versus deliberate inputs that you can manage in order to achieve that plan. So underneath all of this, leadership for innovating is this basic concept of spending time in the future. How much time do we spend and deliberate in today's business, today's results, today's tasks that need to happen versus spending time in understanding, defining, testing, and experimenting in the future? Bezos had this recent quote, all our senior executives operate the same way I do. They work in the future, they live in the future. And it's a real simple decision that you need to make, which is how much time, how much resource do we allocate to executing for today versus investing in the future? I don't know what the right answer is for you, but I do know that you need to be thoughtful and deliberate about how you make that execution. Because the simple mistake is in not being clear about that. And what happens is today's demands, today's execution always wins out over spending proactive, deliberate time in the future. So the lesson is this, how you spend your time and attention and resources is the decision you're making about the future. And are you going to invest in creating that future or are you just simply optimizing for today's results? I get asked a lot, John WTF, which stands for John, what's the future? M my wife sometimes asks me a different form of WTF. I think for Amazon and for so many businesses, the, the, the future is about integrated customer experiences, leveraging technology and data to get better insights, removing friction from the customer experience and from operations and becoming both a great operating company as well as a company that is very systematic about its innovation. We've covered a lot of material today about leadership, actual techniques, processes, tools, in order to create a culture and a system for innovation. I wanna say thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for Formstack for sponsoring this. Please don't hesitate to reach out, ask me any questions, follow up, give me feedback. I really appreciate the opportunity and best of luck to you in innovating and creating the future.